Hey guys, hope you are all having a fantastic week so far. One of the more popular topics of conversation these days is in regards to the affordability issues that people are experiencing when they want affordable housing. I did some digging and found that the current state of the housing market is the most unaffordable it has been since 1984, according to one measure, as purchasing a house now requires a significantly larger portion of people's income. Unfortunately, this lack of affordability is not expected to improve in the near future. In recent weeks, U.S. home prices have risen for the first time in months, and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate has reached a 22-year high of 7.23%. This has further exacerbated an already grim affordability situation. At present interest rates, buying a median-priced home with a 20% down payment would necessitate a monthly principal and interest payment of $2,440, as reported by Black Knight, a mortgage technology and data provider. This is $1,172 more per month in mortgage payments compared to just two years ago. It represents a 92% increase and is placing added strain on household budgets already grappling with inflation in various areas. Currently, Black Knight states that 38.6% of the median household income is required to cover the monthly payment on the average home purchase, making housing the least affordable it has been since 1984. Andy Walden Vice President of Enterprise Research and Strategy at Black Knight, points out that bringing home affordability back to its 25-year average would require a combination of factors, such as a significant decline in home prices, a substantial reduction in mortgage rates, or a substantial increase in median household incomes. The term, affordable, can vary depending on an individual's resources, but housing policymakers typically consider anything requiring more than 30% of household income as unaffordable. This benchmark is intended to ensure that households have enough money for all their expenses, as those spending over 30% of their income on housing are considered housing cost burden. Over the past few years, rising housing costs and stagnant incomes have increased the financial burden on many households. Between 2019 and 2021, the number of cost-burdened homeowners rose by 2.3 million households to a total of 19 million. This includes 8.7 million people, or 23% of all homeowners, who were severely cost-burdened, paying over half their income toward housing. The number of cost-burdened renters also increased by 1.2 million households to a record 21.6 million between 2019 and 2021. These affordability challenges continued in July as rising mortgage rates and low housing inventory pushed prices higher. Edward Seiler, the Mortgage Bankers Association's Associate Vice President for Housing Economics, noted that mortgage rates above 7% and expected to remain above 6% by the end of the year will continue to pose hurdles for prospective homebuyers. Moody's Investor Service predicts that U.S. home buying costs will remain elevated through at least 2024. This could lead cash-strapped households to reduce spending on new homes and discretionary purchases, shifting demand toward rentals and lower-cost housing. Home buyers have already demonstrated sensitivity to interest rates, with existing home sales hitting their lowest levels when rates exceeded 7%. Applications for home purchase mortgages dropped to their lowest level since April 19, 1995 as a result. The persistent low inventory of homes on the market is a contributing factor, as many homeowners locked in historically low mortgage rates of 2% or 3%. This has discouraged them from selling and buying new homes. According to Black Knight, Nearly half of all mortgage holders have rates of 3% or less, and over 90% have rates of 6% or less. Joel Kahn, MBA's vice president and deputy chief economist, pointed out that the combination of low housing supply and high prices is further hindering affordability for buyers. Unfortunately, the prospect of sellers returning to the market in significant numbers remains uncertain, even as interest rates have fallen below 6% earlier this year. It may take years before home affordability returns to more normal levels due to the current lack of inventory and affordability challenges. This is not new. Last year I devoted a lot of time into talking about the lack of affordability that would arise even if housing prices cooled down, which they have. As research firm Capital Economics said, given that we are unlikely to see an improvement in affordability anytime soon, many buyers will be priced out of the market while others simply be unwilling to make a purchase. As bidders become scarcer, market power will shift further from sellers to buyers. And this is where I want to bring attention, because in the coming two decades, America is going to face a serious problem. All the housing is owned by older Americans while new generations will struggle getting adequate housing. Check this out, Andy Walden, who is Vice President of Enterprise Research and Strategy at Black Knight said and I quote, to put today's affordability levels in perspective, 
it would take some combination of up to a 28% decline in home prices, a more than 4% reduction in 30-year mortgage rates, or up to a 60% growth in median household incomes to bring home affordability back to its 25-year average. So unless that by the grace of a divine higher power wages are increased 60% without an increase in housing, America will face a housing crisis. Canada somehow is worse, with the average home costing about 20% higher than the US while wages at 65% lower. This isn't just an American problem. With people living longer through advancements in medicine while more and more people become adults as well, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. The most obvious answer to the housing problem is simply the expansion of housing development in areas that see the most growth, but as you might already know, that obvious remedy to a growing problem has now been made a divisive and political issue as well. You see, Wall Street and foreign investors have been investing hundreds of billions of dollars into securing the middle and low-incoming family units in the highest-growing zip codes across the nation. Their ability to yield high return on their investment resides on keeping the supply of available homes limited. Remember, this falls back on fundamental economics. The more scarce supply is, the higher the demand and the higher the price you can bargain. If development of new housing is limited, they can continue artificially manipulating and price gouging the value on their investments. They aren't even selling, but they surely can raise those rents. In the past five years, rent in the biggest across America have risen significantly, sometimes more than double. This problem was made 100 times worse during the onset of the pandemic. I read a recent research based on data from the Household Pulse Survey by the U.S. Census Bureau that revealed that households that had lower incomes, lower education levels were the most likely to fall behind on rents. The pandemic exacerbated the disparities of these groups mostly attributed to the affected industries, health disparities and geographic variations. To me, this was an interesting finding because health problems and buying power are both becoming serious problems in contemporary society. We know obesity is on the rise, we know inflation has everyone barely surviving, having to rely on credit card debt to pay off basic things like rent and electricity. If we saw these groups more deeply affected three years ago, what does that say when these trends continue to grow over time? There are also many other studies that found Hispanics, Asian and black households pay more for subsidized housing. Hispanic subsidized renters pay 25% more and black and Asians pay 17% more. As the housing affordability problem worsens, so will these racial disparities worsen as well, which will bring further conflict which I have no doubt politicians await with open arms to use as ammunition to further divide the country and remain in power. In many other videos, I am always asked what can be done about this. It's hard to provide a variable solution as the problem is very broad, but I can think of various starting points. First and foremost, restricting predatory real estate practices and evictions seems like the first step. Wall Street loves to nickel and dime everyone and it's time to put a stop to it. Restricting them to not be able to buy housing real estate sounds like a good starting point, or at least, limiting the amount that they can buy. Also, ensuring there are laws that protect tenants is incredibly important as well. Tons of practices are used to price gouge and then evict tenants and that has to stop. I think revising property tax codes to reduce burden on families is another big plus. America has this weird obsession with raising taxes without really improving the quality of life people enjoy. I think property tax codes need to be reduced or be eliminated altogether for families across the nation. After these basic issues are resolved, I think the ball of discussion kinda shifts to how to increase economic security for families. Obviously tackling that issue engulfs a larger discussion about the potential need for universal income and highlights broader problems with wage stagnation, so it becomes a much come complex issue of course. But still, I think we can all agree that the housing problem affects us all. If you are a middle or older aged person, you definitely feel for your children, and if you are part of the new generations, you definitely are freaking out about the lack of enough housing available and lack of income to afford it. And that's where I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you for watching this video through its end, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Come check out my Discord, we have tons of content there for you guys. As always, have a great rest of your day and to the moon.